Hi, and welcome to my alliterative talk called Practical Partitioning in Production with Postgres. My name is Jimmy Angelakos. I work as a senior Postgres architect at EDB, and I just love it when people come to me with Postgres problems. And one of the problems that people come to me with is, do you know anything about partitioning? So what we will be looking at today is an introduction to partitioning in Postgres, why you should partition your data, how to partition your data, and we will finish with a practical example of partitioning data on a live system that's currently in use. So let's begin with an introduction to partitioning in Postgres. Let's look at what partitioning is, first of all. So in a relational database context, Partitioning is the division of a table into distinct independent parts. So splitting up the data that's in your table into multiple tables that you can manage independently. Um, so this is what is called uh, horizontal partitioning, which means that we partition the table by row. And this means that different kinds of rows make it into uh, separate tables why we partition our tables is because it makes them easier to manage and uh, easier for you to move around your data and it also improves performance uh, under certain conditions. So let's look at the history of partitioning in Postgres. Postgres has had partitioning for quite some time now uh, it actually made it into core Postgres with uh, version 8.1 back in 2005. And that was known as inheritance-based partition, partitioning, which means that it was based on exclusion constraints. And I believe the person who committed that uh, exclusion constraint code was Simon Riggs all the way back in 2005. Now, this was revolutionary back then. Uh, and you may ask why you haven't heard of this before. Why don't you know that Postgres has had partitioning for so long? It's the thing that this method of partitioning wasn't that great. So it was good and revolutionary back then, but nowadays it's a bit hard to use and cumbersome. So massive improvements came to Postgres with version 10 in 2017 uh, when declarative partitioning appeared. And we will be looking at what declarative partition offers to make your uh, job when partitioning your data a bit easier. So declarative partitioning, as we said, is available from Postgres 10 onwards. And you what you declare in order to partition your data is your partitioning method. So the method you will use to determine uh, which rows make it into which tables, the partitioning key, of course, which also uh, determines uh, where your um, data ends up. Your partitioning key can be a series of columns or one column or any number of expressions. And the value of the partitioning key is what actually routes the data into particular tables. And you will also be defining uh, partition boundaries. So uh, where each partition uh, value starts and ends uh, for each table. So we said declarative, so it's naturally DDL. And the way you do it is you create table. Uh, let's look at a simple example. Create table customers uh, with an ID and a sign-up date. And you partition your customers by sign-up date. A really simple example here. Second step after you create the partitioned table is to create the individual partitions. So you create table customers 2020 for the customers that signed up in the year 2020. And it's a partition of cost uh, for values from 2020, from the first day of uh, 2020 to the uh, first day of 2021, not inclusive. One also interesting thing is that partitions may be partitioned themselves. So you can perform what is known as subpartitioning. Now let's look at why 
you have incentive to partition your data in Postgres. First of all, we need to talk about the limits of Postgres itself. So these are hard limits that cannot be exceeded. And they're also hard to reach because they are uh, quite large in most cases. So let's look at database size. Database size in Postgres is effectively unlimited. So we're okay. Let's look at how many tables we can have per database, and that is 1.4 billion. That's also fine. We're not likely to reach that number anytime soon. Let's look at maximum table size. So maximum table size is 32 terabytes. That was a big number back in the past, but nowadays it seems very likely that you'll be able to reach uh, 32 terabytes because we're in the era of big data and hardware is much more capable these days so you can collect and process much more data than you could in the past. So 32 terabytes is maybe a limit that you can reach nowadays. And keep in mind that this is with a default block size of 8K. Um, you can have larger tables if you have a larger block size, but it may affect your performance. How many rows can you have per table? Well, it depends, and it depends on how big your rows are. Um, so one easy answer is as many rows as you can fit into 4.2 approximately billion blocks. So not too many. Let's look at how partitioning can help overcome those limits. So if you have very, very large tables, partitioning can help you with disk size limitations, first of all. So if you have a table that doesn't fit on one disk, you can spread it across multiple disks by partitioning it. So you can put each partition on a different table space. And here, when we use the term table space is, of course, in the Postgres sense, which means that you can put any table on any file system or any directory. That's all that a table space is. So partitioning can also help with performance in some cases. Uh, so if you have very, very large tables um, and you partition them, you can benefit from what's called partition pruning. So if you perform queries that um, are only interested in a subset of the rows, you only need to go find those rows in their individual table. You don't have to scan through all the partitions in order to find the rows you're interested in. And that's called partition elimination or partition pruning. So that helps with table scans. You don't have to scan the whole unpartitioned huge table, but only a subset of the table um, or one partition or a number of smaller partitions. And it also helps with index scans, which also become faster. Uh, it's much faster to uh, scan a uh, small number of small indexes rather than one huge index. And let's also look at the hidden pitfalls of very large tables that we will uh, discuss a bit later in this presentation. Uh, we'll get back to that. Partitioning can also help with uh, maintenance of very large tables. So when you have to delete all data or get rid of it or place it somewhere else and archive it and take it out of your main database, you have to delete it somehow from that database. And some file systems, I'm looking at you, XFS, are quite bad at deleting large numbers of files in the same directory. So one thing you can do is just uh, drop the oldest data that you want to get rid of as a table. So drop table customers 2020, and you alter table customers to detach the partition um, in order to uh, be able to get rid of it. That means take that partition out of the uh, partitioned table. Um, vacuum is another thing that partitioning can help with. If you have very, very large tables, then vacuum will take a very, very long time to run on your tables. And if you have smaller tables, then vacuum 
gets uh, uh, and has an easier time completing on those smaller tables, your partitions. And that can help with bloat elimination, but also one very important factor that you cannot forget when using Postgres is row freezing. And that is in order to avoid transaction ID wraparound, which is a well-documented problem that you may encounter in Postgres, especially if you have very, very busy tables with a lot of data coming in and out and a lot of transactions. Um, if your vacuum doesn't get the chance to properly run because your table is huge, then you can accumulate bloat and you can also run into transaction ID wraparound because vacuum doesn't get the chance to freeze all the old rows on the table. So we looked at partitioning and let's look at what partitioning is not. So partitioning is not a magic bullet, it is not a substitute for rational database design. And by rational design, we mean here proper dimensioning of your database, normalization of your data, and generally using best practices. Um, however, it can help uh, with the things that we already discussed. Partitioning in Postgres is also not sharding, and sharding is all about putting parts of the data on different nodes, Partitioning in Postgres doesn't do that, so it's not sharding the data. And partitioning is also not a quick hack for uh, tuning your database. Unless you have one of the issues that we've already mentioned with uh, performance because your tables are extremely large, um, just partitioning any plain table won't give you any performance benefits in most cases. So now let's discuss how you can partition your data in Postgres. First of all, the first step is always to perform proper dimensioning for your data. So you need to plan ahead and think about what kinds of data you are expecting to be ingested into your system. So you need to get your calculator out and you need to start counting, first of all, how much data is going to be arriving. So the data ingestion rate is really important, uh, both as number of rows and also the size of this data that you will be ingesting in bytes in order to perform proper dimensioning. Uh, you also need to take into account projected increases. So let's say you have 25 locations, but you know that your uh, locations are projected to uh, increase to 200 by the end of the year. That is something you need to factor in when dimensioning uh, your tables. One other thing to consider is data retention requirements. So if you are required, let's say you only have six months worth of data in your uh, tables right now, but let's say that you're required, for example, by law, to retain this data for six years, then it's just going to be increasing and increasing in size for six years, and you need to factor that in. So dimensioning effectively can inform your choice of partitioning method, but also the partitioning key that you will choose uh, to divide this data into multiple uh, pieces. So one example of practical partitioning is you count how many measurements you receive uh, per day from a network of, let's say, a thousand sensors. So by extrapolating that over the course of one year, you see that you have uh, accumulated about 500 something million rows per year from this sensor network. So you need to keep checking whether what you considered your uh, dimensioning requirements at the beginning of this project are still valid halfway through or at the end of this project, and you need to be prepared to revise your estimates if some of these uh, situations have changed. Um, nothing should be cast in stone. You should always be prepared to make changes to your tables and your storage strategy for them. So let's talk about partitioning methods that we previously mentioned. So uh, as we said, dimension usually will make it clear which partitioning method you should go for. Um, Postgres supports range partitioning, which is 
for ranges of your uh, column key, for your ranges of, of values for your key columns. So for example, ranges of dates, ranges of identifiers, and so on. Um, as we saw, the lower end is inclusive, but the upper end is exclusive, which means that uh, the top end of your range is not included in that table, and it will be included in the next table that starts with the same value. So one other method to partition is list partitioning, where you explicitly list the key values you're interested in. So uh, let's say that you have uh, 10 status codes for a specific thing. You can create 10 partitions, uh, one for each status code. And the uh, rows that have that value or status code in their partitioning key will make it into the respective partitions. So in uh, after Postgres 11, we gained another partitioning method that's hash partitioning. So if you have a value, if you have a column that has values that are close to unique, so let's say uh, things like human readable names, um, then what you can do to divide them into almost evenly sized partitions is to perform hash, hash partitioning uh, of that key uh, by defining a modulus and remainder that uh, are respective to the number of partitions you want. And Postgres will try to divide them as evenly as possible uh, according to a hash function. Um, so you end up with, let's say, four even almost evenly sized partitions. You also need to think very carefully about what partition key you are going to use. So. Um, you need to know your data in order to make the right choice. So you need to perform analysis of your data to figure out what the optimal partitioning key is. And this analysis involves uh, determining what keys you're actually using to retrieve rows uh, from your queries. And you need to factor that in. So if you are uh, selecting by, uh, let's say, date, uh, of a transaction, then it makes sense to partition by dates if that's something that's going to be included in every query. And by making sure that this key uh, that you're using in your queries is the partitioning key, that means that you can have effective partition pruning. So your uh, Postgres will not look at any of the partitions that cannot contain the value that you are uh, requesting. So let's say if you are trying to retrieve uh, transactions from today, then Postgres will only look at the latest partition that contains today's data if you have included the uh, date in your query. And it is also the partitioning key. You can also use multiple columns for uh, higher granularity of partitioning and increase the number of well, that will definitely increase the number of partitions compared to using just a sim single column. Uh, but you can have finer control over how your data is partitioned. So let's now look at what is a desirable partition key. So desirable features for a partition key is to for the key to have high enough cardinality or range of values for the number of partitions you need. So let's say uh, gender is not a very good candidate for a partitioning key, even though uh, it has started increasing in the range of values uh, recently, it still restricts you to a small number of partitions. So that's an example of a key that has very low cardinality. And you also want to choose a column for your key that doesn't change often. So uh, that means that you can avoid moving rows among partitions if that is a value that changes all the time. So by choosing something which is relatively stable for your rows uh, as a partitioning key, you can avoid that. Let's also discuss the sub-partitioning uh, thing that we mentioned. Uh, so that means that you are dividing your partitions into even smaller partitions, and the partitions are simply partitioned tables themselves. So you need to plan ahead in order to do that because you need to define them as partitioned tables from the beginning. Uh, 
So let's look at an example of subpartitioning. You create a table transactions that has number of columns and also has the columns location code, uh, which is text in this case, and t, uh, t stamp, which is your timestamp with time zone. You partition this table by range of t stamp, and now you have a table that's partitioned uh, by timestamp only. But by creating the individual partitions as partitions tables themselves, you can have higher granularity. So you can create the table transactions uh, 202106 for the month of June 2021. And that is a partition of transactions for values from the 1st of June to the 1st of July non-inclusive. And you partitioned that table by hash of location code. And let's choose, let's say, four partitions to divide it in. So then you create the subpartition transactions 202106 partition one as a partition of that partition for values with modulus four remainder zero. So that's the first table out of four that you will be creating uh, partition based on location code. So that will try to divide your location codes into four uh, almost evenly sized groups. We also, we also mentioned partitioning by multiple columns, and you need to be careful because that is not the same thing as subpartitioning. So let's look at, uh, we create your, our table called transactions with uh, the columns and location code and t-stamp, and we decide to partition it by range of t-stamp and location code. So we're using uh, a composite par partitioning key here. So we create our table transactions 202106A as a partition of transactions for values from our first column is t-stamp, so the 1st of June uh, to the 1st of July. And for our second column, let's say we just want location codes AAA to AZZ. Um, so only location codes starting with uh, A. If we try to create another table that's a partition of this table for the same month, but for values starting with B, that is not a thing we can do because it will overlap partition transactions 202106A. And do you see why? Because the timestamp, which is one of our columns 202106 or one, can only go in the first partition. So this is not the same thing as subpartitioning. The ranges that you use have to be non-overlapping for each and every one column individually and not the combination of those columns, okay? So uh, finally, let's talk about what Postgres, well, well, core Postgres does not do. So core Postgres doesn't create partitions automatically for you. So uh, that is something you need to either do in advance uh, for future data that you are expecting or uh, use a cron job that creates those partitions automatically for you. And uh, one other thing that doesn't happen in core Postgres is merging and splitting of partitions. So there's no easy command that you can run to merge uh, two partitions or split them or split a partition into two. So what you have to do is you have to move the rows manually out and into those partitions. And as we mentioned, uh, sharding is not one of the things that Postgres can do. You can't put different partitions on different nodes. But in order to do that, you may have to configure uh, foreign data wrappers to move those tables uh, into, to move those partitions into other systems. So we've discussed partitioning, we've discussed the methodology. Let's now look at how we would go about doing that on a live system. And we mean a really busy system that is active all the time. All of your cores are busy. Uh, you are receiving hundreds of transactions a second from all of your clients. And this obviously means that you cannot interrupt the functionality of the system in order to lock it to perform invasive actions on the database. So let's look at why you would do that. Uh, why you would want to partition a live system that's in production. So one of the reasons that we said is your table is too large to handle. 
Um, so if partitioning can help with managing this table and it's in constant use, what can we do to partition it? So let's look at our scenario. And our scenario says that we have a 20 terabyte table that's quite large by any standards um, that's serving an OLTP workload, which means that transactions keep flowing in to the table all the time. And this table keeps increasing in size all the time. So how do we stop it from becoming an unmanageably large? Um, one other thing that's happening on our system is that vacuum keeps running, but never completes. So the last vacuum that started on the table has been running for a full month. And because the table is busy, it still hasn't finished uh, what it's supposed to do. And that brings all of the problems that we mentioned uh, from vacuum not being able to uh, complete effectively on a very large table. Also, what, can, what is happening on our system is that queries are getting slower. And this is not because just of the, just because of the number of rows that are getting added to the table. And this is where we talk about the hidden performance pitfall that we mentioned previously. So that applies for very large tables. And Postgres has a one gigabyte segment size by default. And by segment size here, we mean the, uh, amount of data that's in individual files that make up the huge table. This is something that can only be changed at compilation time. So you can't adjust for it once you have data in your database. And for our 20 terabyte table, that means that it will have 20,000 files on disk for that table, our 20,000 segments. And why is this a problem, you say? Well, there's this uh, file in the Postgres source code called md.c, stands for magnetic disk. So you can tell that it's an old file uh, from that's been there from almost the beginning of Postgres. And this code manages your tables, <coughs> excuse me, and table access. So this, this uh, file contains a bit of code that looks like this. And uh, this bit of code for our 20 terabyte table loops 20,000 times every time you want to access a page of that table. So that's bad because this code needs to loop through uh, a linked list of segments in order to retrieve the segment that you're looking for, uh, for that table page. This code that I've pasted uh, is from Postgres 9.6 and it has been recently optimized heavily uh, with caching and other things, but it still needs to run 20,000 times uh, for your table. So what do we do? The next steps are to, uh, in order to partition our huge table, we need to perform dimensioning. We need to choose a partitioning method and a partitioning key. We also need to make sure that we're on the latest version so we get the latest partitioning related features from Postgres and performance enhancements that come with each uh, new release. So now let's look at what our table is like. It holds daily transaction totals for each point of sales. And by performing dimensioning, we see that one partition per month would store about 30 gigabytes of data. So we determined that that's acceptable and we proceed. Um, by choosing a candidate key, uh, we see that the best key will be uh, probably transaction date, which means that we can partition our table by range of transaction date. We, of course, need to make sure that there are no errors in our data. So we check that there are no unexpected values, such as uh, dates in the future uh, when you shouldn't have any. And one other thing to consider is that partition sizes don't have to be equal. You don't have to make them all the same size or the same range. So we can, for example, partition older and less often access the data by year instead of uh, by month, if it's not going to be accessed all that often. So now let's look at the things that you cannot do in production. In production, you cannot uh, lock the table totally. You cannot obtain an access exclusive lock on the table or prevent writes because uh, people will start yelling and they will be right if you have blocked their usage of, uh, of, of the table. 
One other thing you can't do is cause excessive load on the system. So perform excessive I.O. or maybe uh, go overboard with your disk space usage. Uh, so for instance, you can't copy a whole 20 terabyte table into an empty partitions table because that will use 20 more terabytes that you may not have on that disk. And people will also start yelling if you exhaust their disk space. So finally, you cannot present an incomplete or inconsistent uh, view of the data. So you can't, for example, show only the partitions table filling up or the unpartitioning one emptying out while you're moving the rows. Or you cannot present only a subset of the rows that are available to the user of the database. So how do you work around these? Uh, let's take it step by step. And the plan is we re first rename the huge table, we rename its indices, uh, then we create an empty partitioned table with the old huge table's name. Um, then we create the indexes that we're going to need on the new partitions table. And if you create them on the partitions table, what happens is they will get created automatically for each new partition that you add to that table. We then first create the new partition, the first uh, partition for the new incoming data, and then we attach the old table as a partition of the new table so that we can keep using it normally. Now, how we do that, there's an asterisk there and it requires a hack in order to do this seamlessly. Finally, once we have all of these steps completed, we move, we start moving data out of the old table incrementally, but at our own pace. So we do this all in one transaction in order to perform the DDL in one step, and that will uh, take probably milliseconds to complete, so uh, minimal disruption, disruption to the system if uh, any of those things requires a lock. So we begin the transaction, we alter the table daily totals, and we rename it to daily totals legacy, the old data. We uh, rename the indexes, so uh, rename daily totals uh, batch ID to daily totals legacy batch ID, and so on and so on for each and every one of the indexes on that table. We then create the empty partitioned table that we will be putting the data in, and we partition it by range of the uh, total date column, and then we start creating the indexes on that table. We then have to create a new partition for the incoming data, uh, that's going to be new. So we create a table daily totals 2021-06 for the data uh, coming in uh, June 2021. So that's a partition of daily totals for values from the 1st of June to the 1st of July. We then attach the old table as a partition of the new partitioned table. And we do that in a PLP GSQL uh, procedure. Uh, so we uh, actually an anonymous code block. So uh, we declare uh, our variables and we set the boundaries that will define uh, this old table because the partitions table doesn't know what sort of values it contains. So we set the boundaries and we select the minimum uh, date as earliest from the table uh, daily totals legacy and the latest date that this table uh, contains, let's say, is until the 1st of June. So we then attach it as a partition, and there lies the hack. And let me explain what's happening here. So validating, uh, attaching the table with the old data in it as a partition would require a full table scan of the 20 terabyte legacy table. This is something that we don't want to do. So in this case, because we know and trust our data to be accurate and we know there's no bad data in there that could cause any problems, we accept that the constraint is satisfied. And uh, because we are satisfied that our data is okay, then we can say that this constraint is uh, confirmed by us manually. So alter table daily totals legacy and we add a constraint uh, that is going to get checked by Postgres in order to validate this data, and we call it daily totals legacy total date. We check that the dates 
are in the range that the legacy table will contain. And we specify that this constraint is not valid. So it doesn't get validated automatically and we avoid the full table scan. So here's what you shouldn't do under normal conditions. You shouldn't touch PG catalog, but in this case, because we know that our data is fine, we just update PG constraint. We set that this constraint is validated. And that allows us to attach the table as a partition. So alter table daily totals, attach the partition legacy daily totals for values from earliest to latest. We end the anonymous code block and we commit. And that has taken care of everything. You are done. You have obtained the minimum amount of locks that you would need to perform this. And you have minimally disrupted the operation of your busy system. So the last step is uh, at our own pace, we move the data into the new table from the old table that's called legacy. So we can do that at quiet hours for the system or with scheduled batch jobs, etc. So what you do is uh, by deleting from the legacy table uh, for a specific date range that you choose to transfer into the new partitions table. So you delete by returning uh, the records, and you are simultaneously inserting those records that are returned into the partitions table. And that's how you uh, do it with uh, minimal disruption, because those tables just disappear from one table and appear in the other one. And you, of course, you have to make sure that the partition that you're moving the data in uh, exists. Now, finally, let's look at why you should be on the latest Postgres version. And as we said, being on the latest release means that you get the latest features uh, with regard to partitioning and also the best performance when partitioning. So Postgres 11 uh, introduced dynamic partition elimination. So you could prune based on parameter values that you were passing into your queries. Uh, so runtime uh, as opposed to uh, static um, analysis of the query um, meant that you could partition, uh, you could uh, prune partitions uh, during the execution of your query on the fly. Uh, Postgres 11 also introduced the concept of default partitions that are catch-alls for uh, receiving data that are not in any of your defined ranges. It also introduced updates on partition keys. Uh, so uh, the hash method that we mentioned, it introduced primary keys and foreign keys, which didn't exist on the partition tables in Postgres 10. Uh, you could create individual indexes and triggers on partition tables. Postgres 12 improved the performance of partitioning and added, uh, it, let's say, improved the performance of copy into partitions tables. It also uh, came with improvements in pruning uh, partitions that made it faster and more effective. It added foreign key references to partition tables. It improved the performance of ordered scans when you have an ordered index on a partition table and so on. Um, Postgres 13, which is the latest released version, added logical replication for partition tables. So you can replicate partition tables and you can also replicate into partition tables using the uh, Postgres native logical replication. It again improved the performance of partitioned operations, specifically with regard to uh, joins and partition elimination. It also added uh, row triggers before row triggers. So uh, you can use those on partition tables. And let's look at what's coming. Uh, what's coming soon with Postgres 14 is re-index concurrently on partitioned tables, detach concurrently so you can detach a partition without locking the table. And also uh, improvements are coming to updates and deletes uh, for partition tables. So those are going to be faster. So to conclude, um, you must know your data and that enables you to understand what exactly you're doing uh, when partitioning your data. So you make sure that you get the best result by dividing it correctly and uh, planning ahead. You also 
need to make sure that you're on the latest release to get the latest improvements. And you also need to make sure that you do this early enough so that you're not in deep water by the time that you need to partition your tables and require hacks such as uh, the live table partitioning that we just went through. Thank you very much for attending this talk. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is virus. And uh, this is a picture of John O'Groats from the wonderful north coast of Scotland. Thank you very much.